Ontario needs 1.5 million new homes, but we have a generational labor shortage. Ouch. We're going to be breaking that one down in this week's reaction video. The next article we'll be talking about is how Canada's foreign homeowner ban is slowly making the rental construction unviable right now. Yeah, that's a weird one of a side effect. And then the last one we have here is protesters gather to demand money back after Mississauga condo developments delayed unit prices increase. We'll be breaking all of that down on this week's episode. Now, if you're looking for some help on how to navigate this real estate market, because things are shifting quite rapidly right now, there's a certain segment of the market that's very slow. There's a certain segment of the market that's seeing multiple offers. It's kind of all over the place. And obviously it's re regionally specific into the micro markets as well. And you want someone who understands what's going on right now to help you with your move in real estate in 2023, you can book a call with me using the link right here. It's www.chatwithzen.com. Simply click on a date and a time that works best for you. And then when you see the prop, fill in your name, email, mobile phone number, and the question you have for me, and then we'll chat then. Good day, Toronto. Welcome to another episode of Prime Properties TV. My name is Zen, and I run and operate a Remax in the greater Toronto area on top of making awesome educational content just like this one. And the first article we're going to be talking about is Ontario needs 1.5 million new homes, but the province faces generational labor shortage. I'm pretty sure we talked about this before, but essentially what they're saying is about 100,000 new skilled trade workers needed to meet new housing demand, according to the province. Now, we've talked about this because a lot of people aren't going into like the blue collar trades. And even though right now there's a lot less like permit starting and contractors are a little bit less busy, there's still not enough people to actually build the amount of the homes. Because when you're building, say, large condo high rises, you have a very high level of skill as opposed to someone maybe who isn't licensed and can just, you know, call it finish a basement for you. Right. So totally different type of skills required. Now, uh, this person here is saying that. We didn't plan properly for, uh, for this and systematically you could see this coming. And I think anyone who's following real estate probably saw this coming too, because we're too many people coming in because the federal government isn't talking to the provincial government. So, you know, the liberals aren't talking to the conservatives and we're letting in effectively almost a million people in, in 2022, but then we're also not building enough. And Ontario eats up maybe like 40% of the population. So let's say 400,000 people are coming onto Ontario. We're not building enough homes fast enough. And this is kind of why we have a problem. This is on top of all the permitting, the delays and all that other shenanigans that happens. But even if that stuff gets resolved, we don't have enough people to build this, right? So they're saying uh, data showing that we shows 96,000 homes were started last year, well over 50,000 short of the annual targets needed for the province of its promise. So, you know, there's that talk of 1.5 million homes needed first year, not even on track, not even on track. Keep in mind, if we, the longer we take to fix this uh, skilled labor shortage, the more it compounds later on because we have to build those 50,000 homes that are missing from this year on the next one. Right. Yeah, it's not going to it's not going to be pretty. So one of the problems that many experts say is, is that Ontario has not been developing enough new skilled talent through educational pipeline to replace the now retiring baby boomers. And I can say this for a fact because a lot of people that I know in my generation or people who are also kind of like even younger, nobody wants to go work in the trades anymore. You know, like get your hands dirty, right? Blue collar work. Even though we've said in the past, they make actually a lot more money than people who go to school, spend money on education and tuition, and then go get a job. Because a lot of people who do the apprenticeship a year or two and then they go and start working they're like in six figures already but the problem is that type of industry is shunned upon as like oh i don't want to be you know working on my physical hands right i want to be behind a desk and typing but in reality they are the ones making more money right now and you can kind of see right here they are more lucrative the little light blue line is a construction hourly wage and then the average hourly wage is the dark blue line you can see basically it's higher throughout in the last 10 years give or take and i can even test it's much higher than that if you know what you're doing right like i know um two three year old master plumbers who are still like under 25 and they're all clearing six figures right or electricians right and i've talked about this before if you're an elevator technician they get paid so much money so if you're in these trades it's perfectly fine it's just i think we need to create a better awareness for people to go into them as opposed to hey just go get your university degree right because nothing against kind of like what some of the degrees out there but even for mine like getting a science degree may not be very useful for getting a job in the future right now there's one more issue kind of i want to call out that uh, this article talks about is the amount of people that are allowed in we go through kind of this like um not a credit system but kind of like a rating system so the more education you have and the more money you're coming the more likely they're going to let you in right the problem right now is if you are someone who's like an electrician um or they have some kind of like blue collar skills from overseas 
it doesn't look as good in the current immigration system. So they don't actually let you in. So that's why uh, this small business owner is saying, just get them in here in the system and then get them to start paying taxes. But the problem is, again, the federal government and the provincial government aren't talking. Because in reality, if you can get them in here and start working, paying taxes, that's probably good for the economy. But our immigration system doesn't work in that manner where they just want people with like degrees, right? Because the easiest way to get a PR is you come here as a student, you pay a ton of money for tuition, and then you, you know, even any kind of like crappy degree, you can uh, use that and then start getting PR. So we need to restructure that system for kind of like us to bring in more skilled blue, uh, blue collar workers. Now, the next article we are talking about here is Canada's foreign home buyer ban slows rental housing construction. So for anyone who doesn't remember, there was a foreign home. Uh, you can't buy residential home as of January 1st, 2023. It's a two year ban, right? So one of the caveats of doing this is that like with all policies and government intervention, it's like you're trying to suppress something in some way, shape or form. It's like trying to hold, you know, like a balloon in water. Eventually it's going to pop, right? And it's popping in this sense, right? So we're saying that in the last two years has already led to a lot of cancellations of commercial property deals that the law's definition of residential property includes that is zoned as residential or mixed use. So essentially, it's just saying that the rules are not allowing anybody to um, buy these properties with more than uh, 3% of foreign money. However, there's a lot of foreign money that comes in to actually build a lot of these apartment buildings, right? So because of the ban, that money can't come in to build these apartment buildings. So in this case, right, there's about a thousand rental uh, only apartment buildings in downtown Toronto. That's basically next because the money is coming in from a European client out the door, right? Uh, now, the thing is, foreign buyers are still allowed to buy multi-res, meaning if it's more than three units, but if you buy the piece of land and you build it, that land is deemed residential. So that's kind of like that kind of grayish area. Honestly, it's probably a really easy fix if they just change it, but are they going to? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> now, this is kind of my take on this whole foreign buyer ban, right? Like, and I'm, it is based on this stat. So it says that non-residents own 7% of all condos in BC and 5.6% in Ontario. So just condos, not low rise homes. Okay. That's a big difference according to stats can. So I honestly don't think that number is very large per se. And in the condo space, like I talked about in before, you do need the condo investors to buy it because generally most of the time end users aren't going to be the ones buying it. And I'm going to talk about that more on the next article, but that percentage is so small, it's very insignific insignificant. But the problem is when you are a politician, it's easiest to basically ban and kind of like talk smack or denigrate people who aren't going to be able to vote, which is non-residents, right? So if you were to kind of say, oh, hey, people over 40, or if they have one home, they can't buy a property anymore. You know, you rule the investor class, you may not get voted in for people who have multiple properties or have aspirations of it, right? But if you're just banning people who are overseas who aren't going to vote at all, this is an easy fix, right? So they're kind of like paper over things, trying to make things look good. But in reality, like it may be slowing down the foreign in investment, but it's not making that big of a deal because it happened in New Zealand in 2018 and prices still went up, right? So there's history in other places of it obviously not working, but you know, we have to go learn that ourselves <laughs> in a very untimely manner. Yeah. Now, if you found any of this content helpful, make sure you share this with other people you know, and while you're at it, smash that like button and subscribe to the Prime Property channel. And if you are looking for some help on how to navigate this real estate market, you can book a call with me using the link right here. It's www.chatwithzen.com. Now, the last article we are talking about here is protesters gather to demand money back after Mississauga condo development delays, right? And unit prices demand. So this is a project in Mississauga. It's called Hazelton. I'm, I can say it now. Highlights of Mississauga because it's an article. I don't want to get <laughs> yelled at by anybody. So they're basically saying 222 families are being destroyed right now and they want their money back. So this builder, I think last year, went into bankruptcy. They couldn't build. It was priced too low. Financially doesn't make sense. Whatever the reason is, um, 220 people are affected. And then they went to them and say, hey, look, we can build this if they increase the price. Um, I forgot the amount is, but it's going to be later in the article. But a lot of people opted for not taking it. But the challenge is now a lot of these people that are being interviewed for this article, they want their money back, but it's still tied up in the system right now. And they said that they're supposed to get back next month. But it's been basically five years of them not going to have a home. The money's been tied up there. And now they're basically pressed out of market and they can't even use that money for anything else because it's been stuck there and probably like get a very non nominal, very small amount of interest on their deposit, which is kind of really crappy for them. So I feel for them, right? So they're saying that the, this person who's being interviewed is currently living with their friends because she's been priced out of the rental market as well because, you know, five years ago, these things were being sold for a pretty, pretty low amounts, right? 
Now, the majority of units have been priced out of the market after 4.5 years of waiting and have lost a majority of 50% of their purchasing power due to inflation prices. Not inflation like CPI inflation, but like house price inflation, right? Because it's gone up more than 50% since this project has launched. Now, the unfortunate thing is that right here, they're saying that uh, July 2022, they wanted to you know either buy at a higher price or get their money back. And it's just taking so long for the system to actually get these deposits back for them. And this is what I was saying earlier about kind of it's actually not that bad for kind of investors to be buying condos, because if you as an end user, OK, listen carefully, you really shouldn't be buying pre-construction because this stuff can happen. Your life circumstances could change. Interest rates may be different. You should buy something right now while you can. Now, I get there are certain circumstances where like, you know what? you haven't built up enough down payment to buy something or you're building up your credit or you're going to get higher income later, right? There are ways around it, right? Like you can do less than 20% down for sub a million dollars and you can definitely make that work. But if you need to get into the market because of pre-con, yeah, you may not have many choices. But if you do have choices, which I would say like a majority of people do when they're looking for a home, but they just want something newer or they think it's a better deal to close later and you go into a pre-con, Stuff like this can potentially happen. Like it's a small case, right? But if it does happen to you, it absolutely sucks, right? So if you had say 20% tied up on this project, which was like 400 grand or so, maybe say for like a medium sized unit, you have 80 grand tied up in this. And you know, 80 grand could have easily gone you like a six, $700,000 unit for less than 20% down, right? So resale makes more sense if you're gonna live in it. That's why condo investors, you're kind of a necessary evil for these things to be built because you know what, if you're an investor, yeah, it sucks that you lost an opportunity cost, but at least you're not homeless and priced out of the market, right? So that's why investors are okay making these kind of gambles, not great gambles, but they're gambles nonetheless. But it just stings more if you're the person that's ultimately ending up trying to live in the property. Yeah, sorry guys, there's just really nothing you can do. Anyways, that's a wrap for this week. And if you are looking for some help on how to navigate this real estate market, or you want to talk to me about what your current situation is and what to do, you can book a call with me using the link right here, www.chatwithzen.com. Until next time, your move, your future. See ya! Now that you're done watching this one, how about this one? Oh, you know what? This one's good too. Ooh, this one's really good. You know what? Just watch the most.